if truth goes then freedom goes we can know the truth because god has revealed the truth to us use your minds your minds have been given to you to find the truth if america is to return to greatness america has to return to truth thank you very much i'm <clears throat> very grateful to redeemer lutheran for taking this risk of having me for two months talk about why christianity lost america to return america to greatness so today my theme is restoring hope to church and america restoring hope to church in america uh, if i may add my thanks to jim and betsy uh, for bringing us all together for those of you who have contributed financially and those who will be contributing we still need about 20000 or so dollars to pay for the videos the first video which you just saw the introduction is now uploaded and uh, the team will be uploading on a regular basis so what has been happening here will become part of a global conversation because if we can get 100,000 churches to do this in America, uh, if we take 15 students each, that is 1.5 million students in year one. In four-year program, American church could be discipling four to six million young people every day, five days a week. And uh, then every politician will be seeking pastors and church leaders because this is where the energy and the youth and the waters will be. So what happens in this small uh, little beginning will impact everything in America because the problem is not simply that students are coming out with debt, but they're getting into this debt in order to destroy their faith, in order to destroy their character. In order to be enslaved by myths, myths uh, that begin as stories, as theories, it could be scientific myths. Today, the situation has already reached where if you want to be a professor in a university, say in biology, and you want to question evolution, you can't expect to become a tenured professor. If you want to be a professor of climate science, if you want science and if you want your research project funded, it will not be funded if uh, you don't subscribe to the myths that have become dogmas, theories that have become myths that have become dogma. If you are, want to be a professor of social science or literature and if you don't believe in gay marriage, this is now the scientific definition of marriage, is different than what it used to be. And if you don't find, fall in line, whether it's psychological science or scientific psychology or social science, any science, uh, you're getting into debts in order to become enslaved by myths, it's myths that destroy, myths that enslave. Christianity liberates because it's pursuit of truth. Now, is there hope of transforming America, turning this Titanic around before it crashes? Hope is actually part of the DNA of Western civilization. When Senator Obama, seven, eight years ago, decided to run against Hillary Clinton in the primaries for Democratic nomination, Bill Clinton uh, gave a very simple argument why Democrats should not vote for Obama and his argument was that he simply cannot win. Therefore, you shouldn't vote for him. Don't put him as Democratic candidate because he cannot win. But Obama was able to 
tap into this underground reservoir of Western civilization, which was hope, the audacity of hope. He was able to tap into the, that uh, DNA of the West. And therefore he won. The second time he tapped into the entitlement culture, uh, which will destroy America, but that's another story. Lots of illustrations can be given that one of the defining features of Western civilization was hope. I've discussed uh, that in this book, uh, in the first chapter on music from Bach to Cobain, that how did the West become, how did the gospel make the West a society, a unique people in a world which was full of fatalism, full of hopelessness and despair, the ability to sing joy to the world was absolutely amazing because the Savior has come, because there is a God out there and you can put your hope in him, your trust in him. So I won't go into the details of that, but if you want to pursue how a hope became an intrinsic part of the DNA of the West, I do invite you to get a copy of that book and you will enjoy at least that chapter later on. <laughs> the book might become daunting, but it is well, well worth pursuing uh, reading that book. Uh, my favorite uh, classic illustration of hope is actually the movie Lawrence of Arabia, a classic. Nobody believes that this particular Middle Eastern city can be taken over. Uh, British uh, military doesn't help Lawrence he believes that he can come from behind. You can't attack it from the ocean because it has guns. But you can come from behind, crossing a huge desert on camels. There are no roads. Uh, he believes he can do it. British don't believe he can do it. They don't help him. But he mobilizes uh, the uh, Arab tribes to attack this city from uh, behind. And when they have recrossed the desert, everybody is totally exhausted. One of the young men who has tried to kill uh, Lawrence is missing. And uh, Lawrence wants to go back to find him in the desert. And the Arab chiefs say, are you crazy? This fellow tried to kill you. We told you you should have shot him. It was written that he should die. Now he is dead. You want to go and find him back, kill yourself? He says, nothing is written. He goes back and finds him, this guy who had tried to kill him and he had co-opted him into his military. Now, that dialogue, it is written that he should die. He should have been, you should have killed him. We were telling you to kill him because he was a traitor. He came, joined you in order to kill you. Now you want to kill yourself trying to save him. Uh, but he says, nothing is written. That man can shape his destiny. We can save his life. We can make a difference. This hope which had been secularized in him Ultimately, he kill, kills himself in a motorcycle um, a race. It's, but uh, that's another long story in which I won't go. But that's my classic image when I think of the Western civilization. I think of Lawrence of Arabia saying, nothing is written, meaning that we can shape our future. Now, how did that hope come? The one very important figure about whom very little is known and acknowledged in America, much more is acknowledged in Europe, is John Amos Comenius. He is the father of modern education. By the time he was 22, 23, he had built the best school in Moravia, uh, Slovakia, where he was, uh, a Moravian brethren, that is a reformed, uh, Christian group which started 100 years before Luther's Refo Reformation. This was a small reformation which had already begun and created this group. He had built up the best school. His theory was that schools are the slaughterhouses of the mind. So he rejected medieval education, pioneered modern education, which will not kill the mind, but awaken the mind. But that was the period 1618 when the uh, religious wars took over Europe. For 50 years, the um, 
wars had already been going on between Catholics and Reformed Calvinists. Uh, there had been a sort of truce be between uh, Catholics and Lutherans since 1555, but by 16, 1568, uh, the Reformed had become strong enough and uh, conflicts had begun which had begun to enlarge, particularly in provinces which um, later became um, uh, Holland and Belgium. Uh, that's where most of the fighting was happening. But by 1618, the fighting had spread everywhere. And by 1620s, his part of Europe came under wars and the Catholic won. And the Catholics told him that uh, we will let you continue your school. <clears throat> You're doing a very good job. You can continue it if you convert. He said, no, thank you. They burned down his, his school. So he spent the rest of his life as a refugee in exile, hiding under trees, bushes, jungles, forests, uh, sometimes uh, in palaces. Um, because of his brilliance, he authored 90 books on education. It was because of his writing that the Royal Society of Science was born. By uh, 1640, 41, Samuel Hartlib and John Milton had invited him to come to England to start the first modern college Oliver Cromwell uh, uh, was supporting the initiative. The land had been secured in Chelsea in London to establish what would have been the first uh, modern college. But then the Civil War broke out in England between the uh, Anglicans and Puritans and uh, led by Cromwell. And Cromwell said, let's put your dreams of the college in the back burner. Uh, we'll do this after the war. Uh, so then he, he, at that time, <clears throat> John Witherspoon from uh, New England was in England and met with Hart, uh, Comenius and Hartlib, and uh, that was the meeting out of which came the educational philosophy of Harvard. Uh, Comenius was actually invited to become the president of Harvard, and last, uh, in the last lecture we looked at uh, the Harvard crest, the shield, with veritas, truth, on three books. That if you want to read, understand truth, you have to read the book of God's words, which is the Bible, the book of God's works, which is nature and culture and history, and the book of reason, which is human mind, logic, mathematics, etc. Uh, you have to read three books together and connect the dots to uh, know the truth, to understand the truth. So the educational philosophy on which America was founded was not common sense, but was rational revelation revealed in three books. The book of God's words, the book of God's works, and the book of uh, reason that needed to be studied. The rationalism began to undermine the first book, the book of God's words, uh, because of which the decline and the problem began. And that's the subject for next Tuesday. On July 1st, I will uh, put my 9.5 thesis of why Christianity lost America. And I will be using PowerPoint because we'll be having two lectures with a break in between. Two hours, so it will be about 7 to 9.30 uh, next Tuesday uh, to give you the full picture of why Christianity lost America. But today we are focusing on hope. Now, the reason for beginning with Comenius is that this 50-year war which has been going on in Holland becomes, is followed by 30-year war from 1618 to 1648, which covers the whole of Europe. Europe is as bad, if not worse, than what's happening today in Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Egypt. Everybody is against everybody. Bigotry, fundamentalism, cruelty, barbarity, as a result of rapes and murders and famine and disease, uh, is killing people. It would be natural for anyone to believe that, well, this is uh, the last days. Jesus is coming back soon. He will start the millennium. Uh, all of these wars and rumors of wars are clear sign that we are in the last days. This would have been easy for everyone to believe. But Comenius believes that Europe can be reformed. 
How do we reform Europe? He believes by educating the next generation. If we can disciple the next generation, we can reform Europe. That's where his vision of education and all these books, that he, his books began to be translated into Arabic because he was the best educationist philosopher. Now, unfortunately, even in Europe, Comenius is perceived as a philosopher of education. Very few people see him as a political philosopher. The concept of nation that we have had in the world, in the modern world, in, in America, comes partly from him. The Peace of 1648 in Peace of Westphalia, where the modern Protestant concept of nation was articulated and upon which America, on the basis of those philosophical ideas, of these ideas of political science or political philosophy, which enabled 13 colonies to become one nation and not 13 kingdoms after the Revolutionary War in the 1770s, comes the, the concept of nation, which was biblical, uh, Jewish concept, comes from, among others, Comenius. So he's very important as an intellectual grandfather of America, both in terms of education, uh, philosophy of education upon which Harvard was founded, as well as the political philosophy which inspired these men why Washington wouldn't become uh, king of uh, a new nation, uh, etc. So Huguenots were first and then Comenius and his uh, colleagues were second in laying the intellectual foundations of what became America and then because of America what became India and all the other nations uh, after the Second World War. Uh, but the point of bringing Comenius into today's discussion is that here is Europe in absolute chaos, hopelessness, starvation, a man who is seeing his own wife die, children die because he is a refugee is running around here and there talking about education, is seeing that in fact, Europe can be renewed. That's the hope. Now, why does he believe that? He believes it because he's nurtured on one book, that is the Bible. This book begins uh, not with Genesis. Genesis is written later. It, the, what happens first is Exodus. Moses goes to the slaves in Egypt and says, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob met with me, and he has sent me to tell you, and then Pharaoh, so first he's meeting with elders, that God has heard your cries. He's going to take you out of your slavery into a land flowing with milk and honey into shalom of freedom. I can imagine the conversation. The elders saying, what? We've always heard that the universe begins with a golden age, degenerates into silver, bronze, and iron age, dark age, and then is destroyed and is reborn. History is always going down from bad to worse. Are you saying, that when the history is going from bad to worse for everyone, for us a golden age will appear? Moses says, look, I'm not a philosopher. I don't know what happens to history and cosmos. I was grazing my sheep, and I saw this burning bush, and the bush started talking to me, and I wondered if I was hallucinating. But the bush convinced me that this is God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He has come to take us out of slavery into the promised land. Will we enter great future or will future be worse than today? I don't know philosophy. Maybe God is beyond the cosmos. He's transcendent. 
Therefore, he is free. He is not bound by laws of history and laws of cosmos. Maybe he can change the future. But Moses, are you in your senses? Pharaoh has 600 iron chariots. We don't have swords. We are slaves. How can we be liberated? He says, look, I don't know. I'm not, no liberation theologian. I'm no military general. I don't have any weapons. Saudi Arabia isn't funding me. Maybe God is free, therefore he is not bound by political and military system. All the laws might be against you. But maybe he is above all the laws and above all the kings. He is free and he wants you to be his image, free. But Moses, that is Red Sea out there. We don't have any boats. We have women and children. They can't swim and all the cows and oxen and everybody, uh, all of this. How are we going to cross the Red Sea? I don't know. I don't have a plan. I'm not the savior. I don't have all the answers. But maybe, you know what? God transcends nature. He's not bound by politics, history, cosmology, nature. Maybe he can feed us for 40 years in the desert. I don't know how we are going to take the promised land, how we will occupy the land. But if God is free, he can make the difference. This understanding of God's transcendence is the basis for the forging the optimistic DNA of the West. In Western history, it was best articulated by William of Oakham in Oxford, a nominalist. Now nominalism is secularized, it means existentialists, but back then it was Christians who rejected Platoism, etc. They were called nominalists. So William of Oakham, uh, the Pope was so upset with him that he was actually house arrested as, as a professor who was her heretic. But this concept of the freedom of God became actually the source of science and the source of uh, a, a, this optimism of the West because soon it came to mean that if God is free, he is not bound by history and nature and politics. He can do what he wants to do. He can shape history. The Renaissance, particularly the humanists of the Renaissance, and they were all Christians. There was no secular humanism in during the Renaissance, this was Christian humanism back then, uh, they understood the freedom of God means freedom of man. Man can make a dis difference because man is made in God's image. He is supposed to transcend nature, to make a difference to nature, make a difference to history. So this optimism of Western civilization came from an understanding of transcendence of God and with a number of writers, beginning with Petrarch and Salutati and ending with uh, Pico della Mirandola, it began to be applied to man, that man is free. How that is related to the birth of modern science is something that I've discussed here, so I won't go into it tonight. But to uh, make it simple, if you look at... Uh, back at the Jewish history. Here are, Moses has crossed the Red Sea with the Israelites. He sends out 12 spies, one from each tribe, to go into Canaan to spy the land. Come back and report. They come back, 10 of them say, oh, it's a great land. America is a wonderful land. But we've lost so much that we can't possibly take it back again. We can't occupy this land. We are pygmies. They have the Hollywood. They have the Wall Street. They have the Pentagon. They have the White House. They have the Congress. Uh, they have the media. How can we occupy the land? This cannot be done, is what the ten of them uh, conclude. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, say 
Well, if God is with us, we can occupy the land. The majority win, but the majority is punished. Ultimately, Joshua and Caleb do go. But there is the walls of Jericho, the first barrier that we have to, the first city that we have to conquer. We don't have any weapons. We have no technology to overtake this, uh, to conquer this city. But Joshua has this vision of the commander of the army of the Lord. Are you for us? Are you against us? Well, I'm not for you if you're not going to really believe and if you're not really going to get down on your knees. I'm commander of the army of the Lord. Well, Joshua does get down on his knees. The walls of Jericho do fall and crumble. That land occupied by giants is in fact taken over and repeatedly the books of history tell us that no, not one good word that came from the mouth of the Lord fell to the ground unfulfilled. The word of the Lord was fulfilled. Yes, he can take a bunch of slaves who are marginalized, intimidated, weak, resourceless, and use them to occupy the land which he has given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They turn away from the Lord. God had said through Moses, that you turn away from my covenant, you turn away from my commandments, I will destroy you. You will be destroyed. Don't put confidence in yourself. They rebel, they are destroyed. Judah is de Israel is destroyed, Judah is destroyed, Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple of God is destroyed. They are there in Babylon, in Medo-Persian Empire, as slaves, as exiles. They're saying our hope is gone. We are cut off. We are like dry bones. There is no hope. The nation no longer exists. We are marginalized like the church in Europe or the church in America. There is no hope now. God appears to Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? That's the question actually which the Jews elders are asking, the wise men who sit on their elder boards can these bones live? Ezekiel is diplomatic. He says, you know, Lord. The Lord says, no, 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 not me. You prophesy to these bones. You prophesy to the Spirit that these bones will live and these bones will become the mighty army. The nation will be resurrected. Now that's the biblical story. That there is a God who transcends nature and history and politics and economics. And he is able to accomplish his purposes. He has given the nations to his son. Ask of me and I will make nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. He will rule. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth is given unto him. But he is seated on the right hand of God. He endured the cross, was resurrected, is ascended, he's seated. And he's asking his church to go into all the world and disciple all nations. Can America be discipled? To connect the dots, this history which begins with slaves becoming a mighty nation concludes with new Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth. Behold, I'm making all things new. This tremendous uh, vision of hope and optimism wrote the DNA of the Western civilization. The problem came 
the pessimism came because this hope which rested on God's transcendence and understanding of what man is free because made in the image of free God, free being, transcendent being, therefore capable of transcending history and transcending a nature and changing history and shaping history. This is what man is. This view of humanity was secularized. So Christianity, the b biblical narrative, biblical worldview made the West an optimistic civilization, but once it was secularized, secular humanist thought that we can change our future, we can write our own destiny, we can create utopia, usher in the millennium, we don't need God. So the hope was put not in God, but in man. That was secularization of humanism. So during the 18th, 19th century, the age of ideologies, the ideologies that developed in Europe, they were a secularization of Christian hope, which, was, which believed in man because it believed in God and saw man as made in God's image, therefore capable of shaping his own destiny. But now without God, he was going to shape his destiny. So ideologies such as communism, fascism, Nazism, <clears throat> socialism, these were ideologies that believed that just as we understand the laws of nature and can use those laws to create gigantic <clears throat> uh, projects of engineering um, and transform uh, economics, transform everything, trans transform landscapes, dam rivers, create dams, create hydroelectricity, change everything, run uh, tr uh, electric trains, etc. Uh, this idea that we can understand the laws of nature, use those laws to create what we want to create, was applied to sociology, that we can understand laws that govern society and in human nature, because man is part of nature, therefore the laws that govern nature, we can understand those laws and use that understanding to create perfect society, utopia. So these were utopian systems. Today we look down upon words such as communism and fascism and Nazism, but in their own time, these ideologies appeal to the masses, to the people, to the intellectuals, to the universities, took over whole nations because these were uh, application of that scientific mindset that we can understand laws that govern nature and use those laws to create a perfect classless utopia. That was Marxism. That age of reason, that age of reason, age of ideologies, created uh, uh, this secularized optimism that man was capable of being the Messiah. We don't need a Messiah coming from above. <clears throat> that secularized Christian hope went up in a mushroom cloud, a couple of mushroom clouds over Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. When the intellectuals, the leaders realized, looking at the horror of the two world wars, looking at horror of communism, 110 million people being killed, fascism, Nazism, that we are not as good as we thought we were. When man tries to become the Messiah, he actually becomes a monster. That was the conclusion of uh, the age of ideology. That's why secular optimism sank into despair hopelessness in Europe. It, in America, you didn't feel the impact of it uh, as the Europeans felt it, that what happened at the end of the Second World War was the end of secular optimism. But you had the, its impact on American theology. 
that when secular intellectuals lost hope, that hopelessness, pessimism, cynicism, was baptized in America by evangelicalism with biblical verses. That's what late great planet Earth was all about. You take secular pessimism and despair that the history is going from bad to worse, and you baptize it with biblical verses. That look, the text says this, Bible says this, that the earth will not be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Therefore, the leaders of the American church, the evangelical leaders, some of the greatest leaders of the 20th century in America, they began to say to their congregations that you give us your billions of dollars and we will take these dollars to evangelize the whole world, but be sure as we spread the light, the darkness shall overcome the light. The yeast of the gospel will not transform anything. The seed of the kingdom of God will not grow into a plant, into a tree, upon which the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth uh, can find shelter and food. History will keep going down from bed to worse until Jesus comes back, everything is destroyed and you are raptured. So evangelicalism, fundamentalism, became the source of Christian pessimism in America. That we can't improve things. So every battle that you lose in Supreme Court, every battle you lose in White House, every battle you lose in a little court or a little election, well, sh surely the end is coming. Jesus is coming back soon because things have to go from bad to worse. We have to be persecuted. We can't improve things. So this is American evangelical pessimism which has been spread globally and evangelicalism has become identified with pessimism. Uh, this happened mainly during the last 50 years. Although dispensational premillennialism won American theology, theological battles in between the two world wars. The idea was there from the beginning of the end of the 19th century, but during the two world wars it won, and uh, creation of Israel in 1948 was the event because of which major theological changes happened in America. Uh, I won't go into those details, but those of you who want to pursue it, I would recommend George Marsden's book, book, Fundamentalism in American Culture. Fundamentalism in American Culture, published by Oxford University Press, that explained what really happened in America but, uh, theologically. But, so although at a conscious theological level, American Christianity has become pessimistic. The undercurrents of the DNA of optimism, hope, that fatalism is still a dirty word. Pessimism st is still a dirty word. Individually, emotionally, I'm an optimist. I believe in the American dream. I believe that uh, things can be better, things can change, that I can succeed. But actually, if you look at the statistics, a uh, number of researchers, uh, polls, they are showing that Western civilization, Europe and America, are more pessimistic about the future of their own societies than many other non-Christian cultures. Jim Burkett just sent us uh, a clipping from CBN about France, 35,000 brilliant young people who can afford to leave France are leaving France because they see no hope. And that's a report uh, sees correlation between what's happening in France and what is happening in America intellectually and economically and institutionally, that people in France have no hope for France. So secular hope is gone. To return to the scriptures, God is asking Abraham, 
Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Daniel, Jeremiah. He's saying to Jeremiah, Israel is destroyed, Judah is destroyed, temple is destroyed. But he says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that I want, you not to, I want you to know the plans I have for you. I have destroyed you, I brought Nebuchadnezzar. But I have plans for you. These are plans to prosper you and bless you, make you a great nation. If you turn from your wickedness, repent, I will bless you, I will heal you, I will heal your land. I'm interested in your souls, but I'm not interested simply in your souls. I'm also interested in healing your land, healing your economy, healing your political system, healing your legal system. I want to make you a great nation. How will you become a great nation? He says to Abraham in Genesis 18, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? This is on the eve of destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. No, I won't hide. Why? Because Abraham will surely become a great nation. Why? Because he will become an educationist. He will teach his children, instruct his children. He will disciple his children and his household to do what is right, to do what is just. He will instruct them into virtuous life. So Abraham will become a great nation because he will start a virtue project. That's uh, Genesis 18, 18. <laughs> That's what Moses begins to do. Moses' mission is to take a bunch of slaves, transform them into a great nation. How is he going to do that? God gives him the Ten Commandments, a written text that is put in the heart of the nation, in the Ark of the Covenant. The whole camp is around that. Uh, organized around that. Why does God do that? Because he didn't go to an American missionary school. If God had studied in an American missionary school, he would have respected the oral culture of these slaves. They were brick makers. They didn't need to know how to read and write. They didn't know how to read and write. But God didn't respect their oral culture. He gave them a written text. If God has given a written text to illiterate people, he expects them to cultivate their mind to learn how to read and write. He, they didn't, don't have to simply read. They have to learn to write because God is saying, you copy this everywhere. On your doorpost, you don't have notebooks. You copy it wherever you can. So you have to learn to read and write. You meditate upon it day and night. God is not asking them to memorize those words, but to meditate upon them, think about them, apply those truths, to every facet of life and to teach them. You may be a brick maker, you may be a fisherman, you may be a shepherd, your job might be to milk cows, but you have to become a teacher. You teach it to your children. This is how you'll become a great nation. So yes, there is cultivation of the mind, but virtues and character is integral part of education, this is what will make you a great nation. So where do they go for, to learn to read and write? Eventually to synagogues. That's where you go to learn to read and write. The priest is priest on the Sabbath. He is, plays his pre, his priestly role, but during the week, he's the teacher. He's teaching them to read and write, and he, he's using God's law as the basic text on the basis of which you're learning both to read and write and to do your sociology and psychology and public health and et cetera and marriage laws and everything else. This is what the priest is teaching. So if the synagogues become the centers of public education, what happens to the temple? Jesus is 12 years old. They have gone, come to Jerusalem to the feast. He danced, he prayed, he sang, he listened to the word being preached, he offered the lamb as, as the sacrificial lamb, he enjoyed the barbecue. Now everybody has gone back, Joseph and Mary are on their way back uh, to Nazareth, he's missing. 
Three days later, their parents find him in the temple. He's not praying. He's not singing. He's not dancing. He's not sacrificing. He's debating in the temple. Why? Mary is quite upset. Why have you treated us like that? And Jesus is surprised. Mommy, what do you mean? I've been telling you for six months that I go to the synagogue, I take my questions to the priest, I ask him half of my questions, he doesn't answer. The other half, uh, he answers, and the answers he gives, I can't accept. Therefore, I've been telling you that I'm saving all my questions. I'm not taking just the lamp to the temple. I'm taking my questions to the temple because that's where the most learned people in the community are. I will get my questions discussed there. Think about it. So the temple becomes the university of Israel because there is fusion of God's law with its application to society and understanding of what life is all about. Now this is what the reformers understood. Many, some Catholics understood before, uh, before the reformers and the reformers such as Wycliffe and Luther were professors in Catholic universities, monasteries that had become universities Therefore, when the Reformation began, and, and the Reformation began in the church, it was at the uh, castle church of Wittenberg that Luther nailed his 95 Theses. And those the debate, the academic debate, with, to which all the university professors were invited to debate truth, began in the church, because the church was the center of learning. That's where all the learned people were. That's where truth was being studied. Truth was being taught. So what the Virtues Project is doing is to initiate the same, similar kind of a movement, movement to get the churches thinking once again. What has gone wrong? Why did we lose America? How can we disciple the nation again? Can the history, can future be better? Or must the darkness overcome the light, which is the church? The challenge before us today is, are we going to be like the ten spies who don't believe that we can take over the land? Or will there be Joshua and Caleb here who believe that if we get onto our knees and our faces before God, He is able. He is able to use us to disciple this nation again because He has given all the nations to His Son as His inheritance. America belongs to Him. India belongs to Him. But He's seated on the throne He's asking us, us to go and to disciple the nation. That's the challenge the Virtues Project bring, brings to you. Thank you. If truth goes, then freedom goes. We can know the truth because God has revealed the truth to us. Use your minds. Your minds have been given to you to find the truth. If America is to return to greatness, America has to return to truth.